Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore. I am Elizabeth, our virtual events host this evening, and I am joined this evening also by John Ladon, who is the assistant manager at Gibson's Bookstore, our nonfiction expert, and who we turn to when someone has a particular request for an excellent new nonfiction book. We are joined this evening by Simon Winchester. Simon Winchester is the acclaimed author of many books, including The Professor and the Mad Men, The Man Who United the States, The Map That Changed the World, The Man Who Loved China, A Crack in the Edge of the World, and Krakatoa, all of which were New York Times bestsellers and appeared on numerous best and notable lists. In 2006, Simon Winchester was made an officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen. He resides in Western Massachusetts, but he is joining us this evening from the Berkshires, now, tonight's book, which we hope will be a New York Times bestseller, is Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World. This book is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We do have signed book plates. Thank you very much, Simon. And we are happy to ship, offer curbside pickup, or in-store browsing. Um, John will be in conversation with Simon. John is... Uh, going to be great at this. He's one of our excellent moderators for in-person conferences, and we're very thrilled for him to be making his virtual event debut. Please join me in welcoming these two gentlemen. Gentlemen, take it away. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, that was a very nice introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to talk to Simon Winchester. As um, Elizabeth said, I, you know, I get called on to recommend books a lot, and it's always an easy call just to recommend one of Simon's books because it often fits the bill. Um, so we're going to talk about Land, his new book, which I hope you've seen. This is a advanced reading copy of it. Um, and the first question I have for Simon, it, it's sort of the um, obvious question, but where did the idea for Land come from? Uh, you've written, I, I don't know if you just got tired of writing books about oceans or, or, or what, but where, what, where did this idea originate with you? I had um, been living in Hong Kong for 13 years. And then in 1997, I decided to come to this country to live. I've been a correspondent for The Guardian in Washington in the 70s, and then in New York in the early 80s. And then I'd gone to Delhi and various other places. Then thought I was going to settle down now and um, bought a little cottage in a very remote town in Dutchess County, New York, called Wasaic, and had loved being there. And in fact, that's the house where I wrote The Professor and the Madman. So that's when I, as it were, stopped being a journalist and tried to enter this world of trying to make a living by being a full-time author. And um, the land around the house, what in England would be called the policies, I suppose, was perhaps a, an acre or two, but there was a plumber from the Bronx who um, used to come hunting on the land that surrounded my land. And one day he, he always used to leave me venison and often a bottle of cognac after a successful <laughs> hunting season. But he would, um, he came one day and said, look, I, I, I'd like to continue hunting, but I don't want to own the land because I, I pay such a lot of taxes. Would you like to buy it? And so I said, yes. I mean, the price was extremely reasonable. So I bought this tract of essentially useless land. I'm not a hunter by any means. And um, it, it was at the north face of a mountain. It's very beautiful, has lots of streams coursing down it, a lot of old stone walls and charcoal pits. And so it was historically interesting. But ultimately, I decided that I wanted, now I had sort of got into the idea of being a sort of a gentleman farmer. I wanted land that was more horizontal. So I <laughs> sold the house, came up here to Berkshire County, Massachusetts, where there's plenty of horizontal land, at least there is where I live and um, have lived here for the last 20 years, I suppose. But I kept the land that the Bronx plumber sold to me. And a couple of years ago, I was walking on it because I know that forest bathing is very fashionable these days, but I do get real peace from walking in the woods. And this was a particularly crisp autumn evening. And I could hear the sound of the train coming into the station about 20 miles away at Dover Plains. And I thought, this is heaven. And I went back home up here and was talking to my wife the following morning about the land and how I loved it. And she said, yes, you, I, I this is her, said, uh, had been reading about the 
policy of enclosing land in Britain, the enclosures, which drove thousands of people off the land in the 15 and 1600s. Many of these people came ultimately to the United States, or the American colonies, or to Australia and New Zealand. And so I put two and two together and I thought, well, wait a minute, common land was turned into private land and that had great social consequences. The land I owned in New York State used to be inhabited by people, the Mohicans, who never claimed ownership at all. So what was it all about ownership? Ownership seemed to have a, a profound effect one way or another on human movement, on social condition and so on. So why didn't I investigate what ownership was all about? And I persuaded my editor this wouldn't be a bad idea and then it was off to the races. And um, this mm. book came out two days ago, the eve of the inauguration, perhaps not the best possible timing. Um, the book is the result. Mm. To blame my it, wife. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we'll give her credit because it's a very good book. And you started with an, a very nice description <coughs> of your New York land um, that's very beautifully written. Um, I'm curious, though, about how you came to decide how to organize the book, because the topic, it seems to me, is one that you could have written a thousand pages on and it could have been very dry and perhaps very philosophical or, or just very boring but you have it well organized in five sections and they all sort of have a little theme and in discrete chapters and stuff and sort of how did you come to arrive at that because i think it's very well done well thank you i mean that to me anyway is the key to a, a book that at least is readable i mean you can to me there are three sort of totemic things one the idea has got to be good and i figured that land is important to a greater or lesser degree to everyone. I mean, we draw all of our sustenance from the land, so it's there and it's fascinating and many times beautiful. So the idea is a good one. Um, I can pour my heart into writing it to make it as pretty <laughs> attractive a read as possible. But if it's not well organized, as you rightly say, it can get completely yeah. out of it and lull you to sleep. And indeed, the book that to me is biblical in authority as a chap, Scott, actually a man whose family I know very well, called Andrew Linklater, who's now dead, called Owning the Earth, which is just as you say, it's a huge, very, very weighty tome investigating the ownership of land all over the world. And it is with great respect. Well, let me put it this way. It's a difficult read. And I didn't want my book to be difficult. So I thought of how to organize it. And I first of all thought, well, if you're going to own land, you've got to first of all know where it is. You've got to know where on the surface of the planet it is and where its borders are, where its edges are. You can't just say, I'd like that land over there because who knows if the person on the horizon owns that bit. And then how do you get it? Do you, um, do you steal it? Do you buy it? How do you, how do you acquire land? And then once you've got it, how do you steward it? How do you look after it? Do you look after it well or ill? And, give examples of that. And land seems to me to be a victim to so much bloodshed and misery and argumentation. So let's look at land as battleground, if you like. And then finally, land, you know, the future, what are we going to do with community ownership and perhaps reverting to a more sensible way of owning land than maybe we do at the moment. So those were the five basic headings. And then there's an epilogue, which is a description of the land in Wasaic and then a rather prologue and then an epilogue which sort of sums it all up and ties a ribbon around it and um, so that's the basic the basic plan but that in a way was the most difficult thing to come up with because as you rightly say it's a potentially very very unwieldy subject yes and I, I, I as I say I think you really did a great job of of making it digestible and extremely it's a it's a very good narrative it's extremely readable um let me ask you how how what is what is your method for research and writing i mean and do you like visit i mean you write about a lot of different places in this book do you visit every one or just have visited some of them i or you know how how do you go about um you know research what is your method for research and writing and and what have you well uh, quite honestly 
I'm pretty certain that everywhere that I've written about in this book, I went to either in order to write about it or had been there previously. Mm. Um, I used to be, well, I mean, just to, to run through it, uh, Scotland and England, I'm fairly familiar with. I used to uh, live on an island in Scotland and I knew the owner. And so the idea of the ownership of islands and the new policies of community ownership in Scotland was fairly familiar to me. And then I've been walking in Finnmark in northern Norway and I knew about the idea of trespass or the idea that there is no law of trespass in most of Scandinavia. Then I needed to go, there's a long chapter or a long section on measurement of the earth and one of the components of that is something called the Struva Geodetic Arc, which is a mm. line drawn in the 19th century from Hammerfest in northern Norway down to Odessa. And it passes through Latvia, and I've always wanted to go to Latvia, so I went to Latvia and look <laughs> at the surveying stations. And then I went on from there to Ukraine to write about Stalin and the, uh, the, what he did with the land in the 1930s, which produced this mass starvation, one of the worst genocides in the world. Then I went to Australia to write about Aboriginal land ownership. I went to New Zealand. Mm. And of course, living in the United States, I wanted about to all sorts of places, um, notably, particularly lands that either had been or were currently occupied by Native Americans. And because I had lived there briefly when I was a student uh, to Oklahoma as well. So there's quite a lot about Oklahoma. It prompted my editor in London to say, oh, not more bloody Oklahoma. But um, I had to pare down my enthusiasm for Oklahoma a little. But yes, it involved a lot of traveling. And uh, thank heavens that it was the, the, the researching part of the book was written before the pandemic hit. And so I was here mm. writing, marooned in the Berkshires by the pandemic. <laughs> for a writer, what better situation could one be in? Mm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, uh, von Stuva um, and who tried to measure the art. And he, he, you ha he's one of the... Uh, people who fascinated me most in the book. There's lots of other characters. Was there someone in there who was your favorite, who you like enjoyed learning more about or learning about for the first time? Yeah, so I, I von Struve was fascinating. I mean, love yeah. great theodolites up in the snows of the Northern Baltic countries in the middle of the 19th century is, is heroic. And also a fellow called Albrecht Penck, who mm. organized this the drawing of a map of the entire planet at the scale of, of one to a million. I thought he was pretty remarkable as well, although that particular project nearly got itself finished, but in the end, in the 1980s, it was abandoned. So the sheets, these beautiful, beautiful maps, I took quite a long time to find them, but I did in the end find the complete set, which maybe we'll talk about later. But I think that my one of my heroes is a chap called Cornelis Lely, and Lely was a Dutchman, and effectively the Dutchman who created most of modern Holland, because Holland, Holland and Friesland, and what makes up the Netherlands, the low countries, is mostly water. There's a huge body of water called the Zuiderzee, which periodically flooded and made the country uninhabitable. And Cornelis Lely said, what we need to do is to block it off from the North Sea so that the sea doesn't rush into it. <laughs> and so persuaded the government and the royal family to allow him to build an enormous dam, which took about six years to build, and which once finished in the 1920s, cut off the Zuiderzee, which now became a lake, huge lake, which slowly evaporated, became fresh water. And then the Dutch engineers, still under the guidance of Lely, who by this time was getting rather old, decided they would <coughs> dredge or build dikes and from this lake, huge, huge lake, they would raise the land up and create new land. And this to me is fascinating because going back to the business of ownership, how do you acquire land? You buy it or you steal it or you, you know, win it as a spoil of war or whatever. But here is land that had never been owned by anyone. And the bit of Holland that I concentrate on, and which is a memorial to this man, Flavor, uh, uh, Lely, 
is called Flavoland. Mm. About a million acres of land just to the east of Amsterdam, which they started draining from the sea in the late 1950s. They built dams all around it. They had huge, huge pumps of a size you can barely imagine, pumping night and day and extracting the water so that very, very slowly you could see mud and then the mud became semi-dry. Mm -hmm. You could never walk on it. Then the government decided to seed it with reeds from aeroplanes. And so it was covered with reeds, which grew very quickly. They set fire to them, which produced a layer of ash. And then they produced more reeds, more ash, got thicker and thicker. And then when it was about four inches thick with ash, they seeded it with grass and a variety of very tough um, plants. And soil was created. Soil that was eventually sturdy enough for people to walk on, and soon sturdy enough for bulldozers and track laying machines. And then it was ready eventually to create for the creation of roads and railway tracks and cities and farms. And so in the 1980s, I mean, this is very recently, the Dutch government announced we have created a million acres of brand new land. We're dividing it into 60 acre plots. and Anyone can rent it at a peppercorn rent. So they put advertisements in the papers and said, come one and all, rent this land and improve it. If you improve it in the 10 years that you rent it from us, then you can buy it and then you can be landowners. Um, but the only caveat was that they wanted to make, in a classic piece of social engineering, flavor land mirror exactly the demographic makeup of Holland, mm. of Rotterdam, of Amsterdam, of The Hague. So the applicants would be, the successful applicants would be chosen such that 30% of this new country or new province, 30% would be Catholic, 30% Protestant, 30% members of the Dutch Reformed Church, 10% other. And extraordinarily, <laughs> it's worked perfectly. There's a capital city called Lelystad, after this man called Linus Lely. Railways, motorways, schools, farms. And it's as dull as ditch water, but it works perfectly. It augments Holland. It, 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 the country is, was bursting at the seams. It now accommodates them all. And it's a stunning success. And it's one of the few places in the world where land never before owned by anyone is now owned by lots of people with no tears shed in the transfer of ownership. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's um, that was a, a great part of the book. Um, that's always been a fascinating story to me. The you write towards the end of the book. At the end of the book, you get into global warming and the sea the sea level rising and how that will affect land. Do you know? Does do the Dutch have plans to deal with that? Are they? I mean, I assume they do because they seem so good at what they, you know, with that controlling the water and what have you. But do you know what they're thinking or is or what their plans are? Well, yes. I mean, they, they publish them. They're very well apprised of, uh, of what's happening. And interestingly, the statue of Cornelis Lely, which is on this great 25 mile long barrier dam separating the North Sea from what was the Zuiderzee, um, his statue is him looking out towards the waves of the North Sea, one of the most stormy parts of mm. the ocean in the world. And he's standing, not looking defiantly, looking proudly at what he's managed to hold <laughs> back. But you can see that his ulster that he's wearing is slightly being blown back. It's all in bronze, of course, by the wind, as if the sculptor and Lely knew that one day he would not be as powerful as the forces of nature that he possibly wouldn't be able to, mm. for all time, hold back the water. Well, in Amsterdam and cities like that, yes, they are preparing. They're building hotels and schools now on floating uh, substructures mm. as the water level rises. So will they too. Um, so they're very well aware of it. But as a caveat paragraph at the front of the book, you won't see it in the ARC you have there, but in the final thing, I put in a note saying, Although we've long believed, and it indeed is the basis of the capitalist economy, the belief that land is immutable, quote, they won't make any more and it's not going anywhere. If you remember that opening scene from Gone with the Wind, where yes. 
where the, the, he gallops over to to um, Scarlet and, and says the father, um, she's thinking of selling Tara. Don't sell Tara because land is the only thing worth working for, the only thing worth living for, the only thing worth dying for, because land is the only thing that lasts. Well, that's no longer true because mm -hmm. the rise in sea level all around the world is nibbling away for the first time in human memory anyway. The, the amount of land is diminishing. We've lost not much, 13,000 acres in the last decade from the east, particularly in the Carolinas, in Virginia, in the Outer Banks. So it's no longer the safe, sure bet that it used to be. You used to be able to buy 50 acres, take it to the bank and say, my land can be surety for a loan and I can buy a tractor or a motor car or a refrigerator or whatever. It's so an important component of the capitalist economy. Well, in 100 years, that may not be true because land will be diminishing. Um, so that's an important caveat. And certainly mm -hmm. it's something that Lely and people that deal with water uh, are very well apprised of. Mm -hmm. Yes, they, yeah, indeed. Was there, I mean, in your research for this book, was there anything that, I, I mean, it sounds like, you know, to a good extent, it was based on sort of stuff you you know, places you had been and, and stuff you had been thinking about for a while, but was there anything that really sort of like surprised you or something new that you learned that you were really excited about when you were doing this book? Well, I mean, one of, one of the things that constantly amazes me whenever I see it is the shutting of the border gate between <laughs> India and Pakistan every night at sunset. Hmm. This, if you've never been to YouTube and spell out the word with the border crossing it is a place called Wagga, W-A-G-A-H. And just go and look at the, the videos of the bizarre ceremony. And the reason I'm mentioning it is this is all to do with a borderline that was drawn in 1947 by this mild-mannered British civil servant called Sir Cyril Radcliffe, who had never been east of Paris, certainly never been in, into India. And Lord Mountbatten, who knew him vaguely, Mountbatten being the last viceroy of India, said to him, rang him up and said, look, Cyril, um, I've got a bit of a problem here because I'm declaring the independence in August, and this was in June, of uh, a new country called Pakistan, two new countries, West Pakistan in the Punjab and East Pakistan in Bengal, now Bangladesh. I want you to come over and draw us a line dividing these two countries. And he offered him a substantial sum of money and said, will you do it? And Cyril Radcliffe said, well, I suppose I have to do my duty. So yes, got on a plane, immediately fell ill because India is full of, or was at the time, full of pretty un unpleasant illnesses. And he worked in blistering heat, drawing with his fountain pen, looking at old out of date maps and demographic statistical books, a ragged line separating the Punjab into two, the western half being Muslim-dominated Pakistan, the eastern half being secular India. And then, 15th of August, independence was declared. The line, the Radcliffe line, this bloody line, he said, was finally <laughs> declared. He was so appalled by what had, he had done and what he knew would inevitably happen that he refused his fee, burned all his notes, returned to England and never traveled again. And as he predicted, the drawing of the line and the creation of a new country with new and artificial borders became the scene of untold mayhem and massacre. And millions, millions died, uh, both in the Punjab in the West and Bengal in the East. So there's only one crossing point mm. to, the, right, to the, the line separating India and Pakistan in, in the Punjab. And that's at this place called Wagga. The line itself, 1,600 miles long, can be seen. It's so brightly illuminated by arc lights and it's razor wire and minefields. Because these are two countries that have been at war four times, and they're both nuclear armed today. Um, mm. It can be seen from the International Space Station. It's one of those things that you cannot see the Great Wall of China, but you can see the borderline between India and Pakistan. And at this one place, Wagga, every night at six, they slam the gates shut and they have Indian sentries and Pakistani sentries, both chosen for their height and the extraordinary abilities to march doing John Cleese-like 
Ministry of Silly Wars, <laughs> stamping and shouting right up to their moustache to moustache. And then they reach across and there's one ceremonial handshake. And then they withdraw and the gates are slammed shut and the border between the two countries is closed for the night. That I found a fascinating aspect of land, delineation, the creation of partitioned countries, none of which are stable, Israel, Northern Ireland being classic examples, India and Pakistan being another. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 if you don't mind, I don't know if it's really a spoiler, but you do come down, I think, with some definite opinions about um, land ownership and property and whether it's better to have it privately owned or shared in some fashion or um, I know you write about uh, you know some of the people in this country who have bought huge uh, who was it the Went brothers the Wilkes brothers Wilkes who brothers, yes. yeah who have bought huge tracts of land and they were formerly open to hunting and fishing and stuff, but they closed them off because they own the people like that. But you seem to be more, um, I, I, I mean, I guess if you want to pontificate a little bit on where you come down on how land should be owned and managed, and you seem more in favor of, uh, you know, being more open to the public rather than not. I, I am. I mean, thank you for framing it that way. I mean, to me, the notion of trespass, for a start, is is offensive. I, I, mm. I know in this country, and I do it with my own lands today, because of a subsidiary problem, which is the idea of attractive endangerment. If I do not post the land that I own in New York, and I've got a few acres around where I'm speaking to you from here in Massachusetts, if, a, if some idiot hunter comes onto my land uninvited and trips over and shoots his leg off. I am liable. At least some canny liability lawyer will make sure that I pay up because of this, my way of thinking, ludicrous idea of attractive endangerment. I have attracted him by not putting notices up to tell him to go get away. However, this to me turns the whole thing on its head because I think everyone should be able to mm. be on land, whether invited or not. And this principle is enshrined in particularly in Scandinavia, and notably in Sweden. The word is Almansraten. Everyone, all men have a right to walk on, providing they behave properly. And that's all it's asked of them. They don't light fires or you know, test bombs or so forth on the land, but you can walk on it, you can walk your dog on it. You can appreciate the countryside no matter who it belongs to. You can't go into someone's kitchen, you can't go into their little garden, but you can be on the moors that be beyond their hedge, even though they may own the moors. That principle has in, been enshrined for centuries in Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, Northern Germany, and in other European countries as well. In the United States, quite the reverse. Almost everywhere, trespass is a crime, which can be prosecuted and you can be forced, forcibly ejected from someone's land if you're not invited. And in places like Texas, that mm. if the, the landowner shoots you, well, you would have a hard time prosecuting him for having done so. So that, to my way of thinking, ought to be changed in this country. This country, which incidentally invented a man called Mr. Glidden, invented barbed wire, which was <laughs> The devil's rope, as it's called, which um, mm -hmm. may be good for keeping cattle in, but also when used for keeping people out is not a, a good thing in my mind. However, there's the other question of ownership of enormous tracts of land. The biggest landowners in this country are Ted Turner, who owns about 1.9 million acres, and John Malone, both of them mm -hmm. are enough cable television people, um, who owns a lot of the Midwest, but also a lot of the state of Maine, um, they, generally speaking, allow people to be on it. They also, in Ted Turner's case, have done a great deal to um, save the buffalo herds, and that's sort of mm -hmm. a good thing. So I don't utterly condemn him. The biggest landowner in the world is an Australian woman called Gina Reinhardt, who owns 29 million acres, which is more than the land surface of England and Wales, if you can believe that. And she basically uses it for mining, which is 
once again, not necessarily a, a good thing. But I reserve special venom for the Wilkes brothers. The Wilkes brothers who <laughs> refuse to allow their photographs to be to appear in this book. They control their image very carefully. Are a pair of, um, if I can say this without um, offending anybody, uh, very, very right-wing evangelical Christians who live in West, far West Texas and um, made a great deal of money from making the liquids that go into fracking uh, operations. The Singapore Wealth uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund bought them out about a, de a decade ago for $4 billion. So these two young men each had two billion, not million, but billion dollars to go on a shopping spree with. And they've been buying up land in Wyoming and Montana and uh, Colorado and Texas. And as you mentioned, excluding people from it, saying, no, this is mine, keep off putting up gates, barbed wire fences, security cameras, and people who in the West have thought much as the Scandinavians do, that this glorious bounty is for all of us to walk on, hike on, climb on, ski on, whatever, now find themselves ex excluded. So they're demons to the local people, and certainly to me too. I think land ownership should be done modestly. We should own relatively small amounts of land and treat it well, extract the, such bounty from it as is sustainable, improve it all the while, and leave it in better condition than when we found it. And if possible, give it away to a community land trust of which a lot of them exist here in the Northeast. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's my homily. End of homily. <laughs> And I, I, I enjoyed also, just as a little addendum to that, that you have a lot of sympathy for Native peoples, and you, you, there's a lot in the book about that and, and their attitude towards land and how, obviously, many of them, you know, got it got taken from them in not very nice, legitimate ways. I mean, I think you, you don't... And I don't I, I mean, it's especially I don't interesting... Well, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, I don't know if it's in your ARC, but I dedicate the book to this chapter. Yes, I saw that, yeah. In there. yeah. Standing Bear, he's a punker. Bear, yeah. In 1879, the supreme arrogance of the white settlers in this country, and of course I can't myself as one of them, who declared him in court to be a human being. I mean, yeah. of course he's a human being. But up to that point, they regarded Native Americans as squirrels or animals from the woods and indeed there were a lot of native american slaves particularly here in the northeast in the early days so the disdain with which people have regarded them and in the case of uh, standing bear here even though he was declared to be a human being by the courts his land was still taken away anyway and most of the yeah. bonkers now live in oklahoma and their lands in nebraska are full of tract housing and speedways and whatever else goes on in nebraska so it's it's not a happy a happy situation. I also very aggrieved by the situation, for instance, of Japanese Americans, who yeah, owned yeah. a pretty fair amount of land in Washington, Oregon, and California, and um, who, if they had one sixteenth blood or more, were rounded up in um, February 1942 and put into ten hastily built concentration camps around the country simply for being Japanese during the war. And um, when finally the war was over and they were freed, most of them found that the land that they had patiently tilled and made incredibly fertile and introduced superbly efficient farming methods to had been one way or another by tax lien or simple theft had been taken away from them. So there are a lot of not pretty stories in this country. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, perhaps, uh, can you tell us uh, what you're working on now are you i mean are you i know you have another book in mind are you able to work on it um with what you know with covid and everything that's going on well i, I sort of think about that every day i mean i've just yeah. I've signed a contract for the book so i have to do it and it's due on the 31st of december 2022 and it will require quite a bit of traveling and I'm sort of assuming it'll require a lot of reading as well. But I think if I begin travel in 
July, August this year. This is me being maybe a Pollyanna or Dr. Pangloss or whatever, and stupidly optimistic. But let us assume I yeah. can get on the plane in August. Then I can, if I do it efficiently, can do the travel by February and then begin writing in April, May. And I should be able to deliver the script on time in 2022. But it's not going to be, it's not going to be easy thanks to COVID. But then I think I have a, a quite understanding publisher. But thus far, I'm very sort of anal about this. I haven't actually been late with a delivery ever. And I don't want to break that <laughs> record with no. this book. No, can, can you tell us what it's about or do you want to hold off on that? No, no, it's, it's a bit, it's, um, it's the provisional title is, is Knowing What We Know, the history of the dissemination of knowledge and the potential, the risk to the future of wisdom. So it's all about what children are taught, what they know, what they should know all over hmm. the world. Is there a common core of knowledge? How these days is it disseminated by newspapers, television and so forth books? Of course, talking about encyclopedias, talking inevitably about Google and so forth. And the consequent, the realization that if knowledge is always on tap, as it clearly is now, there's not quite the need to store it in your noggin as you used to. And if you believe, as I do, that it's a rather trite thing to say, but that wisdom is knowledge multiplied by experience. Then if there's little knowledge, the likelihood of experience creating a vast amount of wisdom disappears. And I think humankind will suffer as a consequence. So that's the basic thesis of the book. And once again, I've come up with, may haven't started yet, but may have to bend a bit, but with five sections. And, um, the traveling will be to go to schools and go to newspaper editors and encyclopedia editors dotted around the world. And um, I'm very much looking forward to it. Subjects get smaller and smaller as they get older and older. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds good. And I, I, I mean, I have from having read your many of your previous books, I have faith that you can uh, bring that out in a in a very readable uh, uh, th at this stage form, I always, I always find form. it very daunting you know when the yeah. contract the ink is dry on the contract and I think oh my god what am I going to do but <laughs> thus far it seems to have worked oh good um I, before before my time is up with you I I wanted if I may ask you about a writer who I've enjoyed many of her books is Jan Morris who I know was a mentor to you and who passed away uh, at near the end of last year. Um, her books, I, I mean, her book on Venice is one of my favorites and her book on Trieste and, and some of her, her others were very, very good. But I know, um, can, you, can you say a little bit about how she helped you? And if you have a book of hers that you would recommend to someone who's, who hasn't read her? Um, Yes, I mean, I, 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 I'd organized myself a little bit better under a table behind me. There's a pin I discovered recently. I'm not quite sure. Can you hear me? I can hear myself. What? No, I can hear myself. Oh. Bouncing back from you. I'm not quite sure what's happening. But as long as you can hear me, that's. Yes. That to have stopped. Um, I've. Sometime in, I think it was early December. I was clearing out an attic and I found a tin, said SW Personal, and I opened it and at the top of the tin was a letter that I hadn't looked at for 50 years. It was dated the 9th, I think it was, of September 1966, sent to me in Uganda, where I was working as a geologist. Dear Mr. Winchester, it said, thank you so much for your letter and I'm glad you enjoyed Oxford, which was a book that James Morris had written. And I can't really tell you how to become a writer, but I can advise you that if you want to <laughs> follow a craft which is not too dissimilar from my own, I urge you to join a newspaper and become a reporter. And um, if you do, then write to me again. Under that letter was another letter, 11th of September 1967, a year later, addressed to me not in Uganda, but to Newcastle upon Tyne in England, where I had joined <laughs> a newspaper and I was a reporter. And I'm so pleased, he said, for following my advice. Now I suggest you do the following things. Don't 
ever lose your sense of wonder. Don't bother to learn shorthand. And every month or so, package up your clippings, send them to me in North Wales, where I live, and I will try and turn you into a somewhat better writer. And in a couple of years, try and join The Guardian. Then there was another letter dated 1971 to me in Belfast. I'm so glad you joined The Guardian. And so it went on. James Morris schooled me in the mm. early the reporter. And then in 1974, changed his life and became Jan Morris. Yes. He and I wrote a book together about British architecture in India. And uh, we, she would stay with me whenever she came to the Northeast United States or when I was living in Hong Kong, would come there and indeed to Delhi. And um, the bizarre thing was that I found these letters on a Wednesday, I think it was, in December. And I used to speak to Jan every month, I suppose, 01441766622222. Number is wow. turned into red. <laughs> I would call her and I wanted to call her to say, Jan, you're not going to believe it. I found the letter that made me a journalist, prompted, made this change, and the phone didn't answer. And I tried again, I tried at her lunchtime, her tea time and her dinner time. And it didn't answer and there was no answering machine. And the next morning, which I think was the Thursday, one of my children rang from London to say mm. that Jan has died. So it was a poignant, sad moment, but, and the book that changed my appreciation of this dead man, James Morris, Oxford, which I mentioned, but more mm -hmm. importantly than that, Coronation Everest which was his account of being the Times, the London Times correspondent on the expedition in 1953, mm. which got to the summit of Mount Everest. And using all the cunning that a Fleet Street reporter can muster, he, Jan, managed to get the news of the success of Sherpa Tensing and Edmund Hillary standing on the top of the summit, wired back to London, such that it appeared in the London Times on the morning of the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. So it had a tremendous symmetry to it, that story. And I thought, my God, I'm a lousy geologist. Maybe yeah. <laughs> if I just go well with a pencil and notebook, I can do something slightly more useful than stumbling around looking for copper in Africa. So very, very important to me was Jan. Very good, yeah. Um, well, you certainly have used geology, at least in your books, um, to some extent, so that it I, it wasn't a complete waste. Not that <laughs> you would think it was, but um, I and there's quite and, a lot of geology in this book, of course, in the lab. Yes, book. yeah, yeah, very much, yeah. And, yeah. and the map that changed the world, which was the yes foray uh, into this world, I dedicated <laughs> to my tutor at Oxford, Harold Redding, who only died late last year. So he's two oh. great trees. And Harry Evans, who was my editor at the London Times, 2020 was a bad year for many people. Oh, right, my yes. Yeah. World, it was a bad year mm -hmm. for me, too. <clears throat> I met yeah. all my tutor and my editor in the one year. Hmm. Well, my, I, I, I also, if I have time here to get you to talk about what I've read is your favorite fiction book. And... Um, which is George Perec. Is that still true? Is that, um, would you like to give Very that nice. a plug? Because it, it's a neat book. And, you know. do, you, do you have it in stock? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And of course, published down the road from you by um, David Godin. In yes. Yeah. Great, great book. Uh, George Perec, one of the all members of uh, Ulipo, which is this French sort of literary gymnastic fooling around with words kind of kind of uh, society, rather like the fooling around with words that Amanda Gorman did so beautifully. I hope you agree with me that the poet, the poem that was read at Biden's inauguration yesterday was Stella. I mean, it was a wonderful piece of writing. And I think George Berich would have liked it greatly. It's, we don't have enough time to discuss what the book is all right. about, but it is the most extraordinary multi-layered pick it up at any page and put it down. I don't think it's narrative. It's it's weird, but wonderful. But having said that, I've been reading my way through the most primitive and childish writing imaginable. Stories 
that occupied my childhood quite literally in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And that's the writing of Neville Shute. No. Yeah. And he wrote um, famously On the Beach, but No Highway, the book I've just finished, and it took, takes about a day to read, it was Ruined City. And I love his writing, and I hope that there will be a revival in his popularity. He's seen mm -hmm. as a bit, a bit too simplistic and ordinary, but in these awful times, it's very comforting. It's like a cup of Ovaltine. You read it and you think, I'm basking yeah. this. <laughs> Indeed. Well, it, On the Beach was a book everybody read when I was young. Um, the whole idea of nuclear holocaust was a popular topic. You know, this was in the 60s. Um, and a town called Al... Uh, he wrote A Town Called Alice, too, yeah, didn't he? Alice, yes, indeed. Yes, because that was... Uh, that was made into a miniseries and so had some had some popularity. I know you also mentioned you like Nicholson Baker um, a lot. He's um, in. He's um, of yours, is he not? No, I. I well, I, he's I, in Maine, I think. Like so many people, I started with the mezzanine, and I've just read my way through him in a box of matches. I particularly love the idea of getting up early and breaking a match and lighting the fire in the morning, and then having deep thoughts before he <laughs> wakes up. They were just lovely, and he's become a friend of mine, and uh, we talk fairly often. So uh, I'm saying earlier that it would be very nice if the two of us could come to your store and have a chat about something. I think we'd strike sparks. Oh, that right. would be fantastic. We'll uh, definitely try to see. I've been making notes. We have. Wait, that, that happen. Hello, Elizabeth. We have some audience questions Excellent. that I would love to ask you. Before we begin that, what was the name of that favorite fiction book of yours again? Uh, it's called Life a User's Manual. Life a User's Manual. All right. And the author is Georges with an S on the end, Perich, which is P-E-R-E-C. P-E-R-E-C. All right. So some our audience members were saying, wait, 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 what was that? What was that? So we have a couple audience questions I'd like to toss your way. Um, Martin asks, how can countries such as the USA and Canada address the systemic stripping of the land from indigenous people? Can you see a future where land carved up into the fee simple system will be returned to collective ownership to indigenous people? I would like that to happen very much indeed. I mean, that runs through as John kindly pointed out, an awful lot of, a lot of what I say in the book, um, whether it will happen. I, mean, I imagine if someone like Bernie Sanders was president, there would be such a wholesale transformation of the land ownership policy in this country that it was a reality. It could be thought of as a reality. I mean, the idea of so many broken treaties. I mean, as an example, I talked a couple of years ago, and this is slightly off topic, um, at the Hotchkiss School, which you probably know is a rather fancy uh, private uh, boarding school in Salisbury, Connecticut. And most of the students there were unaware that the money that helped in the founding of the Hotchkiss School was derived from the manufacture of the Hotchkiss machine gun, which was last used, or first used rather in, in earnest, to kill about 150 Sioux in South Dakota, Battle of Wounded Knee, in the late 1890s. And they were astonished. They had no idea. And so I suggested that maybe on the anniversary of the slaughter, they all, the whole school body should wear black armbands and there should be a scholarship awarded to a Sioux student, uh, somewhat in reparation for, for the manufacture of this terrible weapon. But nothing has happened. So I think it's very unlikely, much as I would like to see the land return, the sovereignty of it, not to the United States government, but to the Navajo Nation or the, um, the Cherokee Nation or whoever. The only one glimmer of possibility is that the new Secretary of the Interior, Deb Haaland, is herself from the Southwest Pueblo people, and she may at least engineer the beginning of such a revolution. I'm not optimistic, but this is at least a glimmer of hope. 
Christopher asks, could you please talk about the care of the land in regards to climate change? Specifically, they're asking about things such as how soils are treated in agriculture. Well, mostly, sadly, once again, in this country, very badly, because the idea of a family farm is vanishing, not so much here, of course, but in the Midwest. I, I remember years and years ago, it must have been in the 70s, I stayed with a family called Judge, who lived in, I think it was Nevada County, Iowa, and um, near Ames. And they had a quarter section, which is what, 160 acres, that was um, set to corn, I think. And Tom Judge, and it was an adorable family. They were quintessentially sort of Norman Rockwell, beautiful American people with young kids and a moderate degree of self-sufficiency and a contentedness which seemed to, to radiate through all of Iowa in those days. And he taught me how to drive a combine harvester and I brought in, with very ragged furrows, I brought in some corn that particular September, October, I think it was, it must have been about 72, 73. Well, I found him again. I was doing a book on the United States maybe four or five years ago and I drove along the Lincoln Highway route 30, which goes from, uh, from uh, Delaware to San Francisco, and it passed by Ames, Iowa. So I wondered if he was still alive. This is now 45 years later. And indeed he was, he took some finding, but in the same house. But that section, the quarter section, had been subsumed into a vast new entity owned by Cargill, or one of these great St. Paul-based international multinational um, farming corporations and industrial farming was being practiced. He said, I can't compete. I can't compete with GMOs. I can't compete with the kind of pesticides that are being used. I can't compete with the satellite directed precision farming. There's no hope for a small farmer like me. So he gave in, he sold up his quarter section and he sit back in retirement now watching these gigantic machines back and forth leach, I mean, taking the goodness out of the land in much the same way that the John Deere plowshares took the soil out of the Midwestern states and took it all into the Mississippi. And that's where it's created that huge delta into the, into the Gulf at the moment. So, no, my, I may come off, this is only the third day that this book has been out, <laughs> and I may come out as a sort of woolly, um, tree-hugging, do good, but I do think to appreciate the land more, we need to own it in a much more congenial and modest fashion. We shouldn't be greedy towards it. And if we're lucky enough to get it, we should treat it well. And if we can't treat it well, then give it over to land associations or community organizations that will, that will ensure it'll be looked after in perpetuity and will not turn into tract housing or open cast mining centers. Uh on that subject, Vin asks, in my town in central New Hampshire and in a mountain town where I taught in Switzerland, there is an economic tension between development on the one hand, which provides local tradesmen, surveyors, excavators, plumbers with employment and land preservation on the other. Often land preservation also takes land off the tax rolls or diminishes the amount it contributes to the town funds. This is another point of contention. Have you found places that have been able to resolve this debate? Mm -hmm. No, I haven't. It's a very interesting, there's a debate going on in the little town I live in here. I'm, I happen to be the moderator of this town. I'm not sure you have the same form of government up in New Hampshire that we have down in the, the Berkshires. So I'm the elected moderator and I have to preside over angry debates about, in the particular instance, the creation of a 600 acre marijuana farm in the town, which the select board keenly wants the tax revenues and the environmentalists, and I would put myself on their side, although as moderator, I'm not allowed to have a side, um, would favor it remaining pristine forest and tax revenues be sought from other potential taxpayers. So the balance has not been struck, but there are people coming up with ideas and um, Certainly the Northeast is where these ideas seem to be being tested best of all. 
and you get the state level organizations like the trustees of reservations you get the county organizations like the berkshire national resources council and they're all trying to figure this out and meanwhile the demands of the population the demands for work the demand for tax revenue is constantly battling against them whether in my lifetime a, a, a solution will be arrived at probably not but it's a, a debate which needs to continue and in a funny sort of way i think books like mine sort of add at least some some metrics to the to the story i hope anyway joey asks how can we change the narrative around land regarding ownership and trespassing etc here in the u.s when it is so deeply rooted in the identity and the culture that effectively is the same kind of of question i, I think it has to begin in the relatively progressive parts of, of the country. And by that, I do mean Vermont, New Hampshire, Oregon, California, Washington State, where the benefits of community ownership can be seen and be palpably displayed to people. Whereas the, the ills of, um, let's say Nebraska or Texas particularly, are very much more evident. I mean, we're reaching I didn't need to tell you, I mean, all sorts of crises, to a degree, of course, global warming enhancing them, but uh, the, the availability of water, for instance, I mean, the great aquifers in the, in the southwest of the United States are drying up rapidly. Something has to be done. And I think maybe here in, particularly along and up the upper Connecticut River, there are movements which are interesting and people who are at least thinking about this and planning one hopes to do something radical which can change the conversation. Uh, Joey also asks, do you have general thoughts on Gar Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons? <laughs> I, I, I do. Um, <laughs> famous um, thoughts about uh, and modern. I had thought when I came to it that this was a, a thesis drawn up a long time ago, but it, it was not. Uh, it's relatively recent. The idea that common land, um, in books, of course, the classic is this one, The Common Lands of England and Wales by Dudley Stamp, brought out uh, in the 1950s, I suppose, which talk about the delight of commonly held land, which in many cases is not, because the tragedy of the commons is that if you allow cattle and pigs and turnips and corn and wheat all to commingle on the same same tract of commonly held land then the pigs will eat the turnips and the cows will trample the wheat and the whole thing will be a, a mess far better than the ideas of conservative economists for fences to be built and barbed wire to be put up and private ownership to wrest the land away from the common folk and made no longer common enclosed in other words which dispossesses a lot of people in the country drives them to the cities or indeed in those days drives them across the ocean to the new world or to australia and new zealand so the whole question of the common land is of course now coming back into the discussion as we, we just mentioned um it's so i'm i'm completely fascinated by it and to people like jerry asking a question i'd love to know what his views are um, maybe we don't have time but i'd be fascinated to know what the view in New Hampshire, a relatively conservative part of the United States, is towards the tragedy of the commons. Is it a tragedy or is it not? We don't have time for his answer, but Joey, if you do send me your answer in an email, I can get it to Simon and we can Please facilitate do. this. Yes. Um, Elizabeth has a question. This might be our last question. Which country's history of land ownership do you most admire? It has to be New Zealand, without a doubt. We, the British, took away New Zealand's land from the Maoris in 1840 by the Treaty of Waitangi. And that has been a running sore for most Maoris ever since. In 1960, I suppose, when I first went to New Zealand, it was like England set in the South Seas. It was irredeemably a part of the United Kingdom. We thank God save the Queen, we drank tea, we played lawn bowls and mm -hmm. tennis. Maoris were totally disregarded. Everything has changed in the last 50 years. Now, God Save the Queen shares is no longer the national anthem of New Zealand, or at least 
shares with a Maori language song, Lord Bless New Zealand, which if you go to see Ailey Western Ra singing it, one of the most beautiful national anthems you can, you can imagine, sang, sung half in Maori, half in, in English. But that's only symbolic. What is also happening and happening at great pace is that commissions have been set up with the intention of giving sovereignty back in many, many cases to the Maoris of land that was taken away from them, either by treaty or in subsequent battles. So the Maoris, not out of the woods yet by a long chalk, but they're slowly, steadily getting their land back. And of course, New Zealand's official name has changed. No longer New Zealand, it's Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud. And most people nowadays, most school children, if you meet them in Auckland or Wellington or Dunedin, where do you live? I live in Dunedin, which, what country is it in? It's in Aotearoa. So listen to that national anthem and be inspired. Land reform can occur and land can go back to the people that truly own it. And remember this one thing, of course, in the last homily of the night, every town meeting that I supervise nowadays, obviously I begin it with the invocation, the, the um, Pledge of Allegiance. But then I ask everyone to remain standing and for a moment honor the people whose land these were before we came. They don't like doing it at all. They feel sort of embarrassed and self-conscious, but slowly they're coming to accept it. Slowly they're beginning to learn about the Mohicans. Slowly they're becoming to realize that this is not our land. We are here because the natives were here first and we are their guests. <laughs> On that note, I would like to thank you very much for joining us this evening, Mr. Winchester. I would like to thank John as well for being our in-conversation partner. And thank you all of you at home. Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Shaped the Modern World is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We do have signed book plates available to include with your purchase and we do ship. Uh, we would love to see this book on the New York Times bestsellers list, make it another <laughs> one for you. And I'd love to have you back to see you in conversation with Nicholson Baker. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. When we can have people back in the store for events, we'd love to see you here with us. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Goodbye, John. Thank I've you, Simon. Thank you. Bye.